So, hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Scottish Running Podcast. And so we've got a brand new guest for you here today. And I'm really keen, I was really keen to get you on for a while, Del. Mm-hmm. Uh, just, you know, time got away from us, but glad we've got you on now. So we've got Mr. Derek Ray, who runs for Faith A. Faith. AC and also GB Paralympic athlete as well. So, Derek, thank you very much for coming on the podcast and finally got you on. Thank you for having me. Uh, that's excellent. And uh, but how you been anyway? Yeah, good, Sean. Uh, all's going well. Um, trying to find some some winter fitness, but no, we're, we're we're getting there surely. Certainly. Excellent. Is well? Yeah, yeah, all good. Valencia, marathon training, going well. Got a bit of a cold last week, but I felt as if I was starting to fly in training the two weeks ago. But it'll just take a couple of weeks for my body to get the systems going again. As long as I'm running and running, not overdoing it, I'll be, I'll be fine. But looking forward to it anyway. When I hear the words marathon training, my ears perk up like a little dog. Um, that's that's definitely music to my ears, that stuff. Mm. Yeah, I, I don't know if you're the same as me, but like oh, my first the, over COVID, I was I was training rubbish, and then this is my first marathon plan back in normal times, and like Craig Ruddy, and the first big run the plan was thirty k, and I was like, ah, right, cool, I couldn't get it done. Like I got to twenty five k, I was like, I am done. Like I'm so unfit, and like I literally crawled to thirty k, and I'm a defence, you know. It's quite a warm night because it started about it starts September, and I was like myself, I don't know how the hell. I'm going to get fit. I've got 13 weeks. But then mm-hmm. fast forward, you know, eight weeks later, I'm doing a 25 mile run, you know, <laughs> very, you know, yeah, quite close good. to my marathon pace. I'm, yeah. I'm coasting. So I don't know if you feel the same way. Like you get to a point in your marathon training, you're doing a big, massive long run. You're just like, this is effortless. Yeah, it's, it's, it's one of the best feelings in the world. Um, especially when you're locked into pace, you think, I can just hold this all day long. Um, and yeah, no, it's a great place to be in. But, that doesn't come with luck. That comes through hard work and dedication. Um, not just the meals you put in, but your nutrition, the way you, your sleep, your hydration, the way you look after yourself. So, yeah, it's a great place to be. Definitely. Right. Yeah. Totally. Especially in after it when you usually feel tired, but a few hours later you're still quite perky and you're like, I'm not yeah. tired yet. <laughs> um, it. I think a lot of guys try and dabble by doing like a super long run and then maybe do like a shake it run that later on that evening. Um, mm-hmm. That's never something I've I've experimented with. But yeah, if you're doing if you're doing like say three hours on your feet, that that's more than enough. To say if you're doing something else later on. But um, yeah, to kind of what you were chatting about there, I remember. So when I was coached with Ron Ron Morrison, Ron as a part of our marketing program. Ron always used to give us one of the last sessions would be like eight times a mile at marathon pace off a minute recovery. So you just lock into your marathon pace on the track, knock at the miles, um, and it was just a, an amazing session to do. But I always remember like the first or the second rep, you think to yourself, how on earth am I going to hold this pace for a marathon? Like two and a half hours non-stop. But uh, yeah, you certainly feel this, you finish the session feeling feeling amazing. Um but you, you almost doubt yourself at the beginning, thinking, nah, no way. And that's with having like 12 or 30 weeks of hard work bank. But yeah, you just got to, I know it sounds cliche, but follow the plan and then trust the process come race day. And I, I believe that things will fall into place if you prepare well for it. Yeah, absolutely. I was talking to one of my pals, a guy called Kieran for Glen Park, a um, guy called Kevin O'Donoghue. He doesn't really run anymore. He opened up a barbers and <laughs> he's he's lost his way. But uh, when he was, me and him were kind of marathon fit at the same time and he was saying the same as well, like in training. We were kind of similar PBs, you know, doing like maybe 2K on, 1K off. But you're doing the 2Ks and like maybe 335 a K. Mm-hmm. And you get the end of the effort, you're like, oh my God, this it's tough going. Like you just, it just you're working really hard. Like you've got a half marathon coming up. But you get the half marathon and you average, you know, 3.33 a K. <laughs> like, no bother. Mm. It just seems, yeah. it's weird how it works, but you just need to trust the process and trust the training and your hard work and it, it does come together. 100%. Like you said as well, something just clicks. All of a sudden you just turn a corner and you think, geez, I'm, I'm there. 
-hmm. you could be four or five weeks away from the marathon, but you, you just feel ready for it. And I think the the race environment, you've got the the, um, the adrenaline, you've got the competitors, you've got the, the spectators, the noise, the number, the, the whole lot, the whole race built up that. That adds to the excitement as well for the race day. So and then you've got to enjoy that whole experience. Yeah, definitely. And you're saying about marathon pace as well. I think don't think you are really I really enjoy training at marathon pace because, like you said, you can just lock into that pace, and when you start throwing yeah. in thresholds, you know the intensity goes up, and <laughs> and it starts to, you know, a wee bit of lactic starts to form. That's that's when I start hating it. But I love going at marathon pace. If it says you know twenty k at marathon pace, I'm like, brilliant! <laughs> I can just lock yeah. in it, hold it. To be honest with you, Sean, when I used to follow like the ones programs, um, we didn't we didn't do much at marathon pace. No, Not, no. So you'd often like the session that said eight times a mile at marathon pace was like one that I did for every marathon block. And one thing run used to do as well is it would so for like my long runs. So I used to do like a minimum of two hours every Sunday. Um, so two hours and not onwards, we would always throw in like a mile or two at marathon pace, especially when the body's becoming tired, the mind's becoming tired. Um, just because where I live in Kirkcaldy is really quite hilly so it's quite difficult to get a good solid marathon based run mm -hmm. um, so if you'd run like a solid 18 miles if you threw in a marathon based mile after running it 6 minute mile in for 18 miles um, to throw like a 5.30 uh, fairly puts the cut amongst the pigeons let me tell you that oh, yeah. yeah definitely mm -hmm. it's, you see that as well you know at the Olympics etc all these guys you know, everyone's at it the last lap, but mm. when it's all about who's got that, who's got that turn of pace mm. into the race, and most importantly, who can handle that fatigue? Who can handle mm. who's a, for me personally? That's just that sounds like hell to me because they would need to do that in training, like also do big long efforts with a lap at full out sprint mode, and yeah. for me, that's just. <laughs> I'd be spewing in, in the hospital after that. Hell of a yeah. But what, yeah. One, one last thing on the marathon is what I will say is like, and I say to a lot of guys that are, so I've written a few programs for, for friends or guys locally that are preparing for marathons and I say to them, you've got 26 miles to run, but your most important mile is your first mile. If you can get, look into your marathon pace or your or desired pace or as close to it as possible given the business and the weaving in and out, but try and look into your pace as quickly as you can um, and everything else just falls into place like a domino effect almost um, if you're feeling great and go off five seconds a mile too quick for the first 20 miles you can easily lose three minutes a mile for the last 10k so if you can, if you think you can build up a minute and a half ahead of your target time you can lose that in one mile you know what I mean so just if you just stick into your pace as quickly as you can and be as regimented as, as you can, and uh, everything else falls into place. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And it's a long, long way the marathon. Such a long yeah. way. <laughs> There's a wave of emotions as well. So you, you you go from feeling like the best run in the world to forty meters later, you think, why in hell? Why in hell am I doing this again? Um, never again. Then another forty meters later, then I can go at this pace all day. So uh, yeah, yeah. One minute you hate yourself, then the next minute you love yourself. You just got to roll with it and understand why you're doing it and, and how prepared you are for it. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. You can definitely relate to that. It's I remember I did my first marathon, I got it halfway, and well, no, you got it, it was the halfway point. Like, they didn't say 21k, it said just come out as big sign saying halfway, which is mm -hmm. unusual because of London, it's it just says the 21k. And um, I, I was like absolutely dying, but then. Mm -hmm. 2k later I was as if I was at an easy run it's mm. strange strange yeah. but weird to the body that's the marathon for you mate that's the marathon yeah absolutely it's an unforgiving beast oh yeah yeah I mean it, it completely like demands respect as well if you do not if you don't don't put in the miles I mean I, I do believe like if you just did a plan of easy running you'll get around the marathon but if you don't yeah. do enough miles that you'll get to 16 17 miles and you'll be dying. You'll be completely chewed up and spat right in the back. Yeah. And the marathon will take great delight in doing that. And it doesn't care who you are and where you're from and what you've got. Um, if you if you show any sign of disrespect to the marathon, 
then I'll give you that back ten some so or tenfold sorry so yeah um yeah no it doesn't it doesn't suffer fools gladly that's for sure no no absolutely not absolutely not. it's not like not like a ten k where you can go off too quick and maybe get to eight k and you're done but you can just maybe yeah. saunter in it's not oh, you get shit. halfway you still get thirty miles to go <laughs> even like your last ten five or ten k you've got all those miles in the legs it's um it's a slog. Oh yeah, no, it's 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 horrible. Even when you're even when you're fit, even mm. when you're running well, you know, it's it's when you get to I don't know thirty eight, thirty nine k, it's and you're still it, it's a massive effort just to maintain your pace and try yeah. and ignore ignore that fatigue and it's it's occurring. It's all it's horrible, but again, at the same time, it's beautiful. <laughs> and something as a drug, so something keeps us in it. Something keeps um, it's like an elastic. You know, you you can get far away from it, then all of a sudden you're you're. It just got your right back in, so yeah, there's, no, there's definitely no getting away from it. But that's in your nature, that's who we are. Um, and we love, secretly love beating ourselves up, I don't know why. We do it week on week, month on month, year on year. Um, it's, 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 um, there's no feeling nor like it, certainly. Oh, absolutely not. I don't know, because when I sent my girlfriend, you know, and did my first marathon, I got to finish line and I was like, oh, I did it. I- I just made it. I just made my target time, and this and that. She's like, "You just ran twenty six miles. Like for us, mere mortals, twenty six miles. Even just completing that distance is a big achievement. That like you've did it, and you know a fairly good time." I was like, "I mean, put it that way. Put it into perspective. <laughs> maybe not being us runners, maybe too hard on ourselves at the time, you know." And this evening as well, like so you're saying there about doing like a thirty k long run for a lot of runners, that would be like unachievable. Um, Whereas you're doing it week in, week out without batting an eyelid. So you it's hard, it's easy to easy to forget that. But when you relate to that, you realise kind of how far you've came mm-hmm. and what ground you've covered and and, and the prep build up. So there's little things like that you've got to just give yourself like a, a little sense of achievement. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But well, you could be chat about Marathon there, was he? <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. But it prompts you, isn't it? Yeah, that's what that's what, that's what I like about it. It's a good thing about running, you can just Anybody else who else is a runner, you can just bust into conversations like that. It's a common ground. Mm-hmm. Oh, aye, absolutely. So, but for yourself, so you're you're well known in Scotland because at the times that you've ran and the achievements you've made in Scotland, absolutely fantastic. And yeah, you're part of the of the the Athletics Trust as well, which we'll we'll get on to later on as well. But what I like to do with all the guests we've got is just. You know, from your point of view, like, you know, where your like, running uh, uh, career started and like, what, what kind of made you get into running as well? I suppose for me, I've always been a person, fitness has always been at the forefront of what I've, what I've done. Week in, week out, month on month, year on year. Um, I started playing football at like eight years old. So I've always been like in a community or a team spirit. I've always been... Um, Heavily involved with working with others, working alongside others, bringing out the best in others, and them bringing out the best in me. Um, I'm never afraid to admit it, Sean. That I was n- never the most gifted. Um, don't get me wrong; I do the basics well. But in terms of your flicks and tricks, and uh, I wasn't any of that stuff. I was just a, a player that loved hard work. Mm-hmm. And in, in order to work harder, I wanted to get fitter. Um, it was always my achievement to come off that path. And I've been one of the hardest men to mark. Not again, not on my ability, but just going non-stop for ninety plus minutes. Um, I wanted to be the fittest man on my team, and also the fittest man in the park on a Saturday. And, and I did that. I started running at eighteen years old. Um, and again, the, the, I had no knowledge of running. Every run I did was a race. I had uh, the same loop around my mum and dad's house. I think it was like five miles. Well, I left the door every every time I ran, and I used to run eyeballs out. Um, and at that point, when you're a novice, you don't have any understanding of like sessions and recovery runs and everything else that comes with training. You just think if you run, run fast, you'll get fit, which you do. Um, and then I started. Uh, my first running club was the Ainster Hardies, so I joined them. I can't remember what age I was. I must have been early twenties. Um. I started to enter some local races. My first real race I entered was the Edna Martin, the Haydehagas, like the relay race. Mm-hmm. So the gym that I used to go to 
um, they took like a bus full of people around through to the race. Um, and I ran, I think ran the fourth leg, which is like, is it not seven or eight miles? There's two five mile legs and there's two eight miles, I think. Um, so I ran that, and then as I was running, training more, again, no structure to my training whatsoever. I used to run two or three times a week, train twice a week, and plan a Saturday. Um, and I used to spin every Friday night. So I was quite, I've always been an active person. Um, I think I felt like the the psychological and the physical benefits of being fit and active, and also the friendships that I made over the years. Um, and so the guys I played football with back in when I was under tens, whenever I see them on the like, whenever or wherever I see them, there's something there's a a talking point. Um, there's a common ground and that will never leave us for the, to the day we we, we die. Um, so I ran the, the hair at Argus and I realised that I was had a, a decent ability at running. Um, concentrated on it more. I ran my first Edinburgh Marathon in 2009. Um, which My target was to run under three hours and I, again I just ran I just ran what I thought I could run in preparation, I think um, my longest run before them, um, before the race was maybe like sixteen miles. Um, at that point in my running career, my taper week was a week off. It wasn't an easy week; it was a complete week off to let the body rest. Um, I'm going to me. I was my body was going into like a a rested state, um, and I ran three hours and three minutes, and I crossed that finish line, and I was an absolute wreck. Um, my body just wasn't prepared for the race. Like you've said, I finished the race and I had a newfound respect for the distance. <clears throat> um, and then by that point, I was doing like more local races and stuff like that. So yeah, that was the beginning of my running journey. Was I was eighteen years old and I started running just to improve my fitness, and then I caught the running bug quite quickly. Oh, I mean, you go my marathon when you're, you know, doing a couple of five mile loops a week football and a spin class and you ran three hours and three minutes. <laughs> That's yeah. quite quite amazing. You know, a lot of people training, training, training. Their target is to break three oh five and they maybe run like three oh seven or something. But it must have gave you a, a good well, I know you give a lot of respect for the distance, but it must have given you a kind of a light bulb moment in in you like oh maybe I've maybe I've got a, a wee talent for this. I think so. Um I think Probably the races. So I, my first ten k that I remember was a grief ten k. Um, have you run it before? No, I've heard of it. Though. It's pretty tough. Um, because I went again. I went as a complete novice. I I went. I, I think if I remember correctly, I, I wore a, a pair of Adidas climacules. So what? What are you running to? Was like gym shoes. Um, I pulled had like football shorts on and, and like a football strip. So yeah, I just. I was very, um, I was a complete novice um, and had no respect for for races and, and just running in general. I just enjoyed it, which was probably the main most important thing at that point. Mm-hmm. But I did realise then I, I, there was a talent there um, and it was kind of nurturing that talent. Mm-hmm. The strange thing is, kind of on that, that I ran, so first marathon was 2009 and then I ran this Edna Marathon again 2010 at that point I'd given up football to concentrate on running um, I don't think I was running anymore I was probably running less because I changed jobs so I was working as like what an onshore rigger so I was working like five or six night shifts a week mm-hmm. so I was just kind of fitting and running as and when I could um, but I think because I'd run the marathon the year before I had that that year's experience so I knew what to expect. I knew how to handle it. Um, I was adamant I was going to run under three hours and I ran 3.15. So, yeah, it just shows you that, again, if you if you don't respect the distance, it, it, it finds you out. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. I mean, I've seen, I've only ran the two marathons, but I've, you know, in Frankfurt, you know, there was this guy and I think he thought me and my two Inverclyde uh, teammates, I think they thought we were pacemakers because we'd get black and white stripes on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then 
and people just kept asking us, well, what pace are we going at? And kept shooting off. And I was like, why do people keep asking us what our pace is? And then I turned around about 14k and there was a big train of guys behind us. I was like, ah, we're not pacemakers. And mm. nobody listened. But those guys who asked us what the pace was, they would then ask us what time are you going for? And we'd be like, you know, under 245. And they'd go, oh, me too. Mm. But they'd, then they'd sprint away. And then twenty k later, you would see them at the side of the road, like yeah. hands in the hips, and like I've never really understood that why people it, and these they're not young guys. No, these guys no look in the mid thirties, early forties, and they just they completely disregarded that they still had you know <laughs> miles and miles to go. I've just never understood it why they didn't just stick to you know like you said even pace and yeah just get into that kind of rhythm. And it's, 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 it's a very, very easy mistake to make. And I've seen guys that are like massively experienced and they still, again, the excitement, the adrenaline of the, of the race day, um, you get this whole new sense of what shape you're in, what your abilities are, and you, you go off like a madman. Um, and most often than not, you live to regret it. Mm-hmm. The same thing as well, like, a lot of experienced ones as well. I don't know if you read Charlie Spedding's book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he was saying about you no know, Los Angeles Marathon, and it was roasting, and he was already warm by the time he arrived at the at the, at the warm up track. Oh. And then um, he seen like Salazar and like De Castella and all that, all these marathon legends. You know, they're all out jogging. You know, warming up, and Charlie Spedding's just like, I'm already warm. So I think he did like. There's like a wee small gym. He did like like four laps of that, maybe like a hundred meters, and then he did like a few like strides and that and stuff, and and that was him. And then with well, the rest of history, like De Castella and the Salazar, they were they they end up getting dropped after you know eighteen mile or so, and it was between Spedding and the but Silva and John Tracy. That was the three guys, and those are the three guys. And I think there's pictures somewhere as well. And it shows you like in the athletes bit and it shows you all these guys warming up, well, trying to warm up, but they're spreading it there, just standing at the side, having a gab. And so even the most experienced guys, you know, the, the, the occasion does get to them and mm-hmm. they don't really take into account all you know, the conditions, etc. as well. So it can it can happen to anyone. And then kind of on that, that's that's a topic we'll discuss at a later date. And there's something very similar to what you just said about the warm up and stuff that that we can go into in, in more detail and um, pull the further in the conversation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, because hey, when you go to a cross-country race, you maybe go, I'll jog 3, 4K, etc. But for a marathon, it's like, uh, <laughs> maybe a K, if that, mm. or do you just walk over and do some strides, etc. But I suppose everyone's different. Yeah. But you said, so you got it at 303, then you're thinking, I'm going to break three, then you're on 315. So, mm. What was the what what happened after that then? I suppose after that, um, life took a dramatic twist. So that was the end of May, two thousand and ten, and then the fourteenth or fifteenth of June, two thousand and ten. I was involved in a serious motorcycle accident. Um, so I was coming home from St Andrews on the east coast of Scotland. I was heading back to my mum and dad's house, and it's like a, a town below St Andrews on the east coast. Um, I collided with an articulated lorry on the way home from one of the towns um, heading towards mum and dad's and I ended up in Nine Wells Hospital and I got home for there like five and a half weeks later. Um, I spent a week in intensive care, five of those seven days or four or five of those seven days I was in a coma. Um, I spent the rest of the time in a rehabilitation ward um, the injuries I sustained in that accident where well, the last thing one has been is what's classed as a brachial plexus injury. So in simplistic terms, it's how the nerves that control how the, the hand and arm moves and works and all the sensitivity. So for feel, temperature, um, different textures, the brachial plexus kind of controls all that. So it damages a lot of the nerves in, in the brachial plexus. Had really bad bruising and swelling to my brain. Um, I broke all, all my ribs on my right side I punctured my lung broke my collarbone and I break in my shoulder blade that 
but the, the, the only one that affects or, or has a lasting effect is the is the nerve damage, which will be for the rest of life now. And that's the reason why I've got to run in a supportive slime because of your nerves basically feed your muscles. And because my nerve supply was kind of depreciated, then it affected the, the growth of the muscles. So I don't have very, I've got a little tiny, tiny bicep. Um, but my forearm is quite withered, so there isn't any muscle there at all. But I suppose, first of all, I'm I'm very, very lucky to still be alive. Like, lucky is an understatement. And I'm, again, I'm lucky to still have an arm, um, given what I was told after the accident by the surgeon. So I've got titanium, my humerus, which goes from my elbow to my shoulder, that's titanium. And I've got titanium in my collarbone as well. So the surgeon who done reconstruction to my arm said that what he thought the damage to my arm was during an accident. I'm surprised that my arm didn't come off completely. Wow. That yeah. is and I think at the beginning of the rehab, Sean, I couldn't move my arm for like 15, 14, 15 months. Um, so I got an, uh, what's classed as a nerve graft operation. So I took a nerve out my left calf and nerve out my right forearm. Um, and what they do is they cut out the broken parts of the nerve and they piece in the new parts wider than that. So just say you break, your your nerve is broken, they'll cut out maybe, I don't know, say two or three inches either side of the break. So then piece in the new piece of nerve. Um, that nerve has got to, to knit either end, but the signal has got to grow from the fingers to the brain. Mm-hmm. And nerves are a millimetre a day in terms of repair, recovery. Um, so it was a long, long haul to get back to some sort of movement. Um, but for a long, long time, I wished I didn't have an arm. But now I'm, I'm glad, obviously, I've still got use of my arm. Um, and I've learned to adapt, and it's just, just normal for me now to be able to live my life. Yeah. And that is, that is insane. Like, that accident, I mean, I mean, that would have, I don't know, have, have, have killed some people, you know, like with the damage you've had, some people might succumb to succumb to their injuries, but that is, I mean, yeah, well, that, that I is unreal. I was lucky because you, you hear you can hear stories of people falling off a a three four foot trestle and becoming paralysed, and if they fall the wrong way and hit, the, hit their head the wrong way, mm-hmm. then yeah, it's game over. So I was lucky in the sense I had good leathers on. Had a good helmet, so that that no doubt helped save my life. Uh-huh. Um, I was told at a later date, uh, so it was all all quite strange, not how it happened, but the, the, the aftermath of it. So the second, the first car that came to the accident was a an, arm, an army medic. Uh-huh. The second car to the accident was the the president of the Easter Hadis, who's a pediatric nurse. Um. The paramedic we came to my accident um, as a paramedic, as a guy I know well now, he's he's a keen runner, good triathlete. Gordon is ex-intensive care trained, so he he was able, he, the best person that I was told that could have came to the accident in terms of the, the paramedics was Gordon Christie that came. Wow. Um, apparently going from Largo War to Nine Wells, maybe like a 20-30 a minute drive police escort. They lost me twice in the ambulance going to nine miles. So, but I was told from Gordon that if I wasn't as fit and, and the pediatric, the orthopedic surgeon, sorry, if I wasn't as fit at the time I had my accident, then I wouldn't be alive. Wow. So when Just, you hear that, you know, when you hear that, you're always, always, oh, you're, you're running a gratitude, but it kind of keeps you motivated, inspired to keep going. Yeah. Uh, and that is, <laughs> and we'll the... run for we'll run for our own health and well being, but there's sometimes there's more to it than that. Yeah, oh, absolutely. And that's that that's that's quite you know, astonishing. But when you had that accident, the first few people on the scene, you know, yeah. that's yeah. I mean, you, you, what's the odds of that? That those were the people who were first to arrive on the scene. That someone's looking after you. Hundred <laughs> percent. Someone was definitely. I used up all my night life Saturday, so I've none left to, to spare. Yeah. But I think as well, if so, if I was any closer to the to Central Fife, I would have went to the hospital in Queen Margaret and Dunfermline, mm-hmm. and then we would have transferred over to Edinburgh. Um, and again, I don't think I would be here. Wow. Yeah. So, 
super, super lucky, but also um, very blessed. No, oh, definitely, definitely. And no, it's it's we 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 really appreciate having you here as well. <laughs> yeah. A great Scottish athlete who's doing a, a, an amazing job and inspiring other, you know, potential Paralympic athletes in Scotland as well, and you know, and motivating people to keep going as well. Um, not just that, but the, the times you've ran as well, I and mean, it's pretty incredible. But so after like the, the accident, and so it was like 14, 15 months or so. So well, obviously we all know you ended up back running again. What was what was the kind of like the first steps after the accident when you felt you know you had the the operations for the nerves and getting you up moving in the arm? What was the kind of no pun intended? What was the kind of first steps to what kind of motivated you to get try and get back out running? I I remember it like it was yesterday and it was thirteen years ago. Um, I used to go to the local hospital, so the Victoria Hospital in Kirkcaldy. I used to go there two or three times a week for basic rehab stuff. So to begin with, like walking was a challenge. Um, I was, so I damaged my right arm. So I, I was right-handed. So I had to learn to do, live my life. So do everything left-handed, which doesn't seem like much, but when you're so used to, having spent 24 years with your lead hand, to change that for writing, eating, I used to have to do my hair, whatever. Uh, it was strange. So I used to go to the rehab uh, department at the Vic and I was just basic strength getting gaining exercises to begin with the, the most basic of stuff and then probably when I found my strength was starting to recover and, and I was feeling I wouldn't say more confident because my confidence was gone completely but just kind of a bit stronger and more able I used to say to Maura my physio week, every week when can we try to run bear in mind at this point I could not move my arm at all so if my arm was to move I would lift it and if I let it go, I would just drop. Um, so it was a dead weight. And I used to say to Morag, every single week, can we try a run? When can we try a run? So eventually, I was put into like a sling you'd wear if you broke your arm or if you had a sticky or, or whatever. Um, because I, I couldn't control the way my arm was moving out at the time, because I had nothing, no sensitivity or anything around this, Sean. Morag wrapped a bit of Teraband around my rib cage to stop my arm from bouncing. Mm -hmm. uh, my first run post accident was probably no more than, I don't know, seven metres from one end of the gym to the other. Uh, and, and, I, and I kid you not, I ran that seven metres and had more endorphins going through my body than the two marathons I finished before, the years, <laughs> the, that year and the following year before. It was, it was incredible. And I just thought, a part of me that I never ever thought would return um, as being a runner, mm -hmm. I thought it was, I thought flame was gone. It was I was blew out, and then I thought, no, that, that's that's there. The, the flame is smouldering away in the background, and then we just kept working away, working away. Um, my wife, my, well, my in-laws, they lived at the top of the town we live in, and there's a school across the road. And I'll credit to my wife. Rain, hail, or shine would be over, even in the snow, they'd be over at the school football fields doing laps to the football pitch. And Susan would often, often just stand and watch me. Um, I, I think at that point I was embarrassed to go out in the streets because um, at this point I was still wearing a sling with the theraband around me. One of the reasons Susan had to come with as well because the, the strapping on the sling was, wasn't designed to be for the bouncing from running. Mm -hmm. So it would stretch a lot. So I'd have to stop every so often to get it tightened up. So I wasn't able to do that myself at that point. Um, but once I started running up the street, Sean, then I then realised that people are going to look at me because it, it must be odd to see someone running towards you with their arm in a sling, regardless of what pace they're running at. Um, the town I live in is a relatively small town, so um, people are going to see me once or twice if they're walking to the local supermarket or wherever. But once you get used to someone looking at you once, the second person looks at you at the same time as the first person, so you get used to it. Um, and I really found myself growing in confidence, and I came off my medication quite quickly as well because I was running three or four times a week. My strength was improving. My mental health was improving. I was getting fitter. Um, I was off my medication, so it was a it was a win-win. Um, I 
one day was bored at my my in laws' house. Uh, I was sitting on the computer and I was I started doing some research or searching the line for a a, a sling that you wear when you run, and I couldn't. I wasn't having any luck. So just by luck, by chance, I went onto the running forum and I put in a post to say, no great detail, what I was looking for, I'd hurt my arm in a, in a motorcycle accident, so I was looking for some support when I was running. Luckily, somebody came back and gave me the contact of the guy that still makes my slings for me today, a guy from America, a guy called Dan Aldrich, um, who has a brachioplexus injury like myself, but his arm is, is completely weathered, so it's maybe, it's probably lost about five or six inches on the, height, on the length of his arm because it's still shrunk down. He can't move his arm at all. So um, he designed the slings that I now wear and get in touch with that guy. And I've met him. He came over to St Andrews to play golf. Uh, There's a tongue twister. He played golf in the World One Aram World Championships. Um, and he said to me, I'm going to St Andrews. Do you live close by? Like, I'm like 40 minutes away. I went and met him. I went to the driving range and met a lot of the guys that play one arm. These guys are of single figures and the, the rate these boys can knock a ball is insane for swinging with one arm. Yeah. Um, and I met Dan and that was a great a great thing for me to do. Just he's such a positive guy. And I've had people contacting me from all over the world. Um, just on Instagram, to see my running photographs. The last week I got the sling. I must have recommended like 20 people onto Dan. Um, and he doesn't do it in terms to make profit. He does it for the joy of helping people get back to physical activity. Um, so meeting him or getting introduced to him definitely helped change my life. My first run in the sling from Dan was the... So I think I started running again outside maybe like mid-December. Um, I started running again in the, out in the streets in early January. And then later, that was 2011. So that was like seven months after my accident. And then the end of May 2011, so like about 11 months after after my accident, I found myself back in the start line of the end of Martin, which was, which was beyond belief. Yeah. Um, my wife had entered, she ran the end of the half marathon in 2010. So I'm going to throw lots of dates at you. So I apologies if you get confused, just ask me for clarification. Oh, that's all good. Well, Susan, my wife, she had entered the she ran the half marathon in 2010, and I obviously ran the full marathon. Um, my memory and recollection of my time in the hospital is very, very, excuse me, very limited. One thing I do remember is sitting on in my boat, in my bed in the hospital, saying to Susan, she had entered the full marathon for 2011, and I said to look, it'd be great because I could help you train for it. And I think we both thought then that's a big ask uh, and also potentially over ambitious. We'd probably best to wait to see how the body recovers. And I think I'd be lucky if I was, if I'd be able to run like three or four miles unassisted. And even that, I would take that at that point because I, I did not know where life, what journey I was going to go on, what path I was going to go on, and how I was going to end up in terms of um, like physical ability. Uh, as it worked out with Susan's work she had massive work commitments so didn't have time to prepare for the marathon so we swapped places so I had originally entered the half marathon Susan entered the full marathon and then probably come March time we swapped places and I, um, I ran the end of the marathon 11, like 11 months after my accident and I, I've been lucky I've had lots of good experiences and I've achieved a few good things in, in running I still think today that that marathon eleven months after marathon was my my best achievement ever. Yeah, well, that's what I was going to ask. Like when you said you know you had the endorphins after running you know like seven meters, I was just going to ask you like, no, what was you know a performance in running that kind of kick started you know that like your you no know, your achievement career I you know the, the the achievements you've got in your career now so. I'm guessing it was that that day in the marathon that like, just gave you that massive confidence to go on and start smashing it. Um, I don't even I don't even think then I had a an idea or a realization that that para was was a thing for me. Um, 
I just wanted to feel like a runner again. I never ever thought of the experience of being able to put, put a race number on to the start line with thousands of other people and feel like a runner. Um, we as runners, we, we choose when we want to do it and how we want to do it. The fact that I didn't think I would ever get to do it again um, was difficult to deal with, mm-hmm. along with other things that was going through my mind at that or the post accident. Um, but to be able to call myself a runner again, not a marathon runner, but just just a runner, mm-hmm. um, is something I never ever thought I would be able to to experience again. And the fact that I went around the marathon course, um, oh mate, it was one of the, my, I was in bits. It was one of the best feelings in the world, and and also, so that was the first big race I had ran in the sling. So the support I got throughout the route for go the guy with the one arm, go the guy that's running with the broken arm. Um, and I felt like saying, do you want, if you get a seat, I'll tell you what's happened a bit. I just kept playing through it. And yeah, I ran, I ran the marathon at like 3.35. And um, yeah, so time was irrelevant. I wasn't, I just, I just ran. I, I ran with complete heart. Um, and again, one of my lasting memories of that, 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 Race Sean was so there's a guy at runs for Dundee Hawks called Billy Gibson. So Billy's Billy's a an, an insane ultra marathon runner, um, a very very nice guy. I think he's second, finished second or third in the West Highland Way, and that uh, Billy's a, is a top top bloke. Billy was my so the bed that I had in hospital, the bay that I was in, Billy was just charging us for that bay. So Billy and I, Billy got to know me quite well over the four or five weeks and my family and, and everybody that came in to see me. Well, unbeknown to me, Billy was a runner and mm-hmm. he didn't know that I was a runner. Um, so in my marathon, like 24 miles, the body was shot. I was ready to just to, to walk and not give in, but just to, just to get to the finish line any way possible. Uh, at the corner of my eye, I seen this guy in a blue and white vest and he looked at me as I looked at him. And he says, Dell. I said, Billy. He says, what are you doing here? I said, I think it's pretty self explanatory. Well, the uh, Billy was the last person I expected to see, it, and he was the last person that he expected. I was the last person that he expected to see. Bear in mind, Billy seen me when I was unable to walk in hospital, um, when I was in tears because I couldn't do this, or I was an emotional wreck because of the medication I was on. Um, so yeah, to, to be able to finish that marathon together was just was just an amazing buzz, uh, and we went to the finish line together and, and crossed the finish line together, and it was, it was like it was just made to happen. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, again, that's uh, that's one of the lasting memories of that that overall experience that I would never forget was um, seeing Billy towards the end of the race was just it was just amazing. That's is like incredible. Like, do, you know, do you know what that is, Sean? That is the power of sport, the power of running. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, there's been, I've, you no, know, pretty much, you know, like all my friends, both, both of them, <laughs> uh, that I've met them through running. You know, the all my life is, you know, no, all my, everything, you know, people in my local town, they go, I was going, I mean, are you still running? You know, it's kind of what we're kind of known for, you know, because it is such a hard sport. It is such a hard thing. You know, a lot of people will say, oh, i seen you run the other day there. Like, I, I tried to do a 5K and, and majority of, like, you know, like maybe people who don't really take up running, they'll be like, oh, I, I don't know how you do that. But it's just trying to get through to people. You know, anyone can do it. It's, and yeah. when you do kind of crack that, you know, first few months, though it is addictive and it is, and you meet so many good people throughout yeah. running. Mm-hmm. But like I was just about to say there as well, with your accident, you know, the stars kind of, you know, aligned with the people who were there, you know, the you know, the paramedic, etc. as well. And it seems like the stars aligned as well, like you and Billy were, you know, meant to. <laughs> yeah, I know, 100%. He was meant to be in the hospital when, you know, experienced that with you. It's it's quite a quite a fitting end to, you know, at the end of, of your like recovery journey, like he was there yeah. to finish the marathon with that's a that's a brilliant end to, to a, a recovery story. Totally. And even, even to date, if I was to see Billy at a race or whenever I see Billy, I often simply, well, I don't often, 
or something's going to the MWL's hospital, just in the ward that he works in that I went, I was in Ward 19, and so that was an orthopedic ward. Some people who have had something similar to me, mm-hmm. just to go around and try and, try and um, create a positive message or spread a positive um, message to these guys that I was on death's door, and for me at that point, life was completely over. Um, I could have went one way or another, and luckily I've went the other way. Um, but just to, just to go and speak to these guys and say, never ever give up hope. Um, and Billy's one of the first people to congratulate me on a race, a performance, team selection, whatever. And the first thing I do um, is, I, is I accept that thanks, but I thank him because if it wasn't for him, or he's a part of the, the team that helps save my life. And if it wasn't for these guys, then I wouldn't be in the position I'm in today and a, B, B, be the person I am today. Yeah. Mm. And I'll never for as long as I live, Sean. Yeah. And yeah. like you're saying, like the guys you played football with, and when you're 10 years old, you've got, you know, you've got them stories. Now you've got yeah. that with, with Billy. You've got that mm. with him for yeah. the rest of your life as well. Which yeah. Is, I mean, mm. and, you know, You've just personified it, you know. That's what sport does. You, know, you get these stories in sport, and you've got one of them great stories. Yeah, thank you, mate. That's excellent. But yeah, but that's that. that that's all your, all your, all, all this stuff. Now, 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 let's go into you, onto you, when you became, you know, GB <laughs> Paralympic athlete, etc. As well, because I remember seeing you at, like cross country races, and I'd be like, I was like, who's that guy with the sling? Like he's rapid, like he is. And I've got I me, mean, I've got two arms going, and I kind of keep up with him. And I'm like, oh, that's Derek Ray. Like he's he's running, and then he's running whatever times. And and I would see you at the Great Scottish Run. Yeah, you would see you on TV. You'd be you know up with like the, the say like the leading woman, you know, running like yeah. sub seventy pace and stuff. And and I uh, just well, I was like, guy, he's he's absolutely flying. And I think that's well, cross country. You know, we we're always you know I could always see you about there, but. It was mainly on the road. You know, we start to notice, you know, yeah. like, if you go into like, Power of 10 and stuff, you maybe, well, I would go into Power of 10 to check out like results. So we'd click on my name and then you'd see the results. You'd see that like, your name there, but like, you no. Know, and then I would, me, I'm just a curious me brain that I've got. I would go, oh, guys, he's a para. He's a para athlete. And I would check out like like the times, like how your time would compare to like, the rest of the world. I was like, I, I think this guy maybe could be, you know, if he, that he, he should be getting picked for, you know, the GB team. And then, like, as I've seen on the Scottish Athletics, etc., you know, you were picked, uh, you know, for the GB uh, para team. So what what was the first time you were picked for, you were selected for GB? I went to Rio 2016. Um, 2016, right. So I, 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 I'm guessing, I, I kind of knew, um, in order to get recognised within... British athletics. Um, as I was starting to train more, um, so I joined forces with my coach, Ron Morrison, we all coach. We came together in January 2013. So that's 2012 through having had operations um, and I knew the place to get spotted was going to be the London Marathon. Uh, no question about that. Um I knew in order to get into London Martin, I had to secure a good for each place, which meant running sub 305, I think, um, was a good for each time at that point. It was 2013. I ran Edinburgh again. Um, I prepared well for it. And I ran, I want to say, 252, I think I ran in Edinburgh, 2013, which, which, which got me guaranteed into London. I ran London, good for age, 2014, and I think I ran, I'm going to test my memory here, I think I ran 247 in London, 2014. Um, on the way home, so I'd been in touch with British Athletics at that point and then, um, they were starting to kind of put the feelers out. On the way, a few days later, my wife and I were still in London, um, the head coach of British Athletics at that point, a lady called Paula Dunn, she was in touch to ask if I'd be willing to go up to Berlin to be classified. So in order to compete in para sports, you've got to be classified to make sure that my disability um, falls into the criteria with the other guys with a disability like me 
So we're, we're it's, a, it's a level playing field. So I'd been classified within Great Britain um, just to kind of get me used to that process because when you do an international classification, it could be anywhere in the world. And there's sometimes like there's a, there's a language barrier and it's a very, very daunting process. Um, luckily for me, that I only get classified once, but like the visual impaired athletes, I think some of the, the intellectual impairments, they get classified every two, or th- every three or four years, I think. And it's horrible because your fate is lying in someone's hands or resting in someone's hands. So I went into Berlin with my wife. Um, I got classified out there. I raced as a part of the classification. And then luckily for me, the T46 class, which I am, is, is above elbow amputation or a similar disfigurement. And luckily for me, the T46 competed in the marathon at the, the at that Paralympic level. Um, 2015 was my first representation for Great Britain in the the IPC Marathon World Cup at London Marathon. Um, I ran, uh, I think I ran 2.44, I think. Um, and I ran again in 2016, and I think I, I, I should be checking period 10, but I'm just trying to wind here. I think I ran 2.40 in 2016, which was under the qualifying time for, for real selection, but I didn't know, um, at that, I was quite naive at that point, I didn't know, I didn't really look into the selection criteria, um, but I, I, according to, well, now what I'm led to believe, or now what I know, it's not just the qualifying time that you, or how far under the qualifying time you are, it's your position in the world, world rankings, which kind of, uh, that's um, your likelihood of meddling. So you've got to be, I think, top three to make automatic selection, or top two, and then also be under the qualifying time. So there's three rounds of Paralympic selection. Round one is like for the automatically uh, selected. Round two is for the relays. And then round three is for like any seats that are left on the plane and rooms that are left in the village almost. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's the round for appeals as well. So guys aren't selected, they can appeal at that point. Um, and luckily for me, I was I was um, selected to go to Rio. I remember the day, again, like it was yesterday, the day I got the call from my head coach to say I'd been selected. Um, the meeting was on a Monday, selection was on a Monday. I knew it was on a Monday. I was expecting a phone call all day at my work. Um, about half past four in the afternoon, I felt my phone vibrating in my pocket. I was on tender hoops the whole day. I felt my phone vibrating in my pocket. I pulled my phone out. I was my mate. Like, oh, no, no, no. Now's not the time to speak to me. I thought you were someone else. So I just cut him off. Yeah. Walked home from work. Phoned my wife to say, that if I've not been phone contacted by now, it's bad news. So that's the end of that journey. Um, my Monday, when I followed my plan, because I was I was preparing for the marathon at this point, because I had to prepare for it. Um, I think this was like July. Um, so only when I got the news, I think I flew out like five or six weeks later. Mm-hmm. So I'd been away warm weather at this point to, to prepare. Prepare as if I was going. I was like more than halfway through my marathon block. Um, I went and did a fat leg session on a Monday. Came home. I was in the garage getting getting changed and my wife came bound into the front door and said, Dale, that's your head coach calling. Um, I'm like, just just leave it. I'll get changed. I'll come in just now because, to be honest with you, I can't really be bothered hearing the news. And Paul left my voicemail and the voicemail said that I'd been selected to go to Rio. Mm-hmm. Uh, my wife and I were overjoyed. We were hysterical. We were crying. We were cuddling. Um, I just... I completely went full circle. How to begin with, I was I was fighting for my life. Um, to then not thinking I'd be able to run five miles, to be able to then run in seven meters, to then this this whole trajectory I was on this uphill trajectory, and then to top off to get selected to go to Rio was was just testament to everyone that had helped me um, along the way, um, and again I also testament to the hard work that that, that I and me had put in. Um, so I always I'm one for showing my gratitude as much as I can and it's impossible for me to thank everyone that's helped me along the way but I genuinely hope that um, they've seen that selection as a way of me thanking them because I wouldn't be in that position if it wasn't for the people that helped save my life 
Yeah, and that's, like you say, full circle. He goes from fighting for your life after the accident to being an Olympian, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it's... It's uh, you should you should actually have a film about you. Uh, <laughs> the many people I've said something about writing a book, and it's something I've I've, I've seriously considered. Um, yeah. but it's just it's been able to jot all that down. Um, I suppose that by speaking to the right person, um, there's there's probably something for a book there. And like, again, it's not to make any any profit. It's mm-hmm. just to. I suppose it's just a way of, of help on being able to thank people that have, that have been a part of the journey and then just to note it down, to jot it down would be a good way of kind of reflecting. Yeah. And also for others that are in, end up in this position, uh, God forbid there's not many, but mm-hmm. uh, let, let's them kind of read it. There, there is hope out there, but you've got to believe in yourself um, and work and trust others. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, mm-hmm. I think, I mean, I think if you approached any, any ghostwriter or any publisher, they'd be... Yeah. More than happy because it is an absolutely incredible story, um. Because it it, it is, it, God forbid, it, it does happen to anybody. But a lot of people they might have not come out the other end. They might have just been yeah. like accepted. That's me. I'm done. But not yourself. You you always had that bit in you like I want to be a runner again. I really, and then yeah. you want to get back to that feeling, and that really, really did keep you going. And that really does. If anyone has, you know, had, you know, accidents, etc., it's affected their life. You know, you're a great example of, you know, if you just keep going, that it can be done. You know, if if there is a possibility it can be done, yeah. then if you just, like you said, don't give up hope, you know, there's, there's maybe a wee light at the end of the tunnel. Completely sure. And don't get me wrong, there's, there is days, and there still is days that you think, really? <laughs> um, but you, by thinking about kind of what's went on in the past and, and what you've achieved and what you've battled through puts things into perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, by just by never giving up hope, um, realise or, or fully understanding why you do it. Um, so I suppose it would be the right time to see if there's anyone that, that's listening to this and watching this that, that feels that they've went through something similar. It doesn't have to be like a, a life-changing accident. It could be anything. Um, if there's anything, if, if they want any information or to ask me anything or don't be afraid to reach out. Um, yeah. A question asked is a, it then becomes a question answered and you won't get that. You won't get an answer unless you ask a question and that could be anything at all. Um, so but don't, don't be afraid to, to reach out and ask me anything, anything you want. I'll, I'll be more than happy to, to yes. share it. And then, and if I could point someone in the right direction, then I'd be more than happy to do that. Yeah, and not just like people who've maybe been through a physical accident, if people who are maybe really, really struggling with their mental yeah. health, you know, because I can't even imagine how mentally how much you must have been feeling, you know, during that time. You know, I know it's for me. It was, it was, it was just what was going on. One door closed, and another one kind of would. I wouldn't say another one opened. I was at that point. I was. Post accident, I was stuck in this corridor. Um, my old life had finished, mm-hmm. and my new life quite hadn't hadn't quite started because I didn't know where I was, who I was, what I was doing. Um, but I've been very lucky to have like an amazing my girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife. Um, it, it affected Susan and my parents and my family more because they see me fine for my life. To begin with, I wasn't sure that A, if I was going to wake up and B, what state I was going to be in when I woke up. And then when they realised I woke up and I was compass menace, um, I'd went back a lot because I was I was really confused and shocked to a memory loss all that. But I got over all that um, and they've kept me on track and they've kept me motivated and, and, and hungry, but it affected them. And even Susan and I, we still chat about my accident to, to this day and Sometimes like they kind of hear the stories because it, it's, it's a it's a forgotten memory for me now. Um, yeah. But Susan relives it; she can relive it like it was yesterday. And she was told to take photographs of me in intensive care. Um, and when I'm doing like a motivational talk or, or like a group talk to, to adults, um, I tend to use my photographs in those presentations. And a picture speaks a thousand words, yeah. and these ones do because I'm hooked up to all the machines going. And the strange thing is, Sean, is, is, is I, I, I know it's me, 
but it doesn't feel like me because I, I have no recollection of it. Um, mm -hmm. And I could look at the photographs all day long and chat about them all day long. And it never ever, it never ever will feel like me, but I can guarantee it is me, or it was me. Yeah. Mm. How far you've came. Yeah, so Rio, the, to get the, the call for Rio was, was an incredible uh, an achievement, an accomplishment, and it was a great experience. The the downside of the the icing on the cake would have been if the race went well. Mm. Um, the, I suppose the, was the race ever going well? No, I don't think so. Um, I was not prepared for what I was going to face that morning of of on the Copacabana beach in Brazil. Mm -hmm. um, we had thirty five degrees and ninety percent humidity. Uh, so a marathon off the east coast of Scotland um, isn't built for that. I had done two and a half weeks in Lanzarote. So again, I had done no heat prep, heat chamber, humidity, nothing. Mm -hmm. I just went on a dry heat and I thought that would be enough. Um, and the, the race, Susan, my wife and my, my father-in-law, they, they were at the race. They went out to Brazil for like four days. Um, and you're chatting about the warm ups there. Susan's dad was taking photographs of me. Um, and there's a photograph of me standing at the bottom of the grandstand my arm, arm over the barrier, um, chatting to Susan, and I've just got this really worried look on my face. I have to say, I know what I'm going to get into, but I don't know what the outcome's going to be. Um, I vividly remember we got a kit checked in the morning of the of the race at like six a.m. I went down to the basement level of the the our Timberblock and Athlete Village, and I remember walking at the front door of my accommodation block, and I was um, like walking into a sauna. It was insane. And that was before the sun had gone up. That was like, it was pitch black. Um, but because I was running the, the Paralympic Marathon, I was buzzing. So it was, there was nothing where I probably would have contained me that day or or calmed me down. Mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't the time for anyone to say, or I, I don't think it was a time for anyone to say, have a think about what you're going to be doing. Um, certainly Susan and her dad weren't in a position to, to alter my game plan. Um, and I probably knew from mile, uh, mile seven, mile eight, that I wasn't going to finish the race. Ah, I see. Mm. See, but, and I, but and again... I, uh, well, unfortunately, I dropped out at, at eight and a half miles, and it's, and it's a feeling I'll never forget. Yeah. But again, though, I mean, 35 degree heat, 90% humidity, that's... Uh, that is insane. I mean, you get hot days here in Scotland, and you go out a mm. run... You know, it's in the summer there was a couple of days at twenty eight degrees in Greenock anyway. And um you come back, you know, from like a, you know, a ten mile run and you're running nice and easy, but your heart rate is, you know, ten, fifteen beats on average higher and it's unbelievable how how much harder your body needs to work just to yeah. stay cool. And, yeah. and you're at, at, at um like the biggest sporting event in the world with people trying to race you and stuff like that as well. And the heat's one thing, but the humidity say that that is a killer. Yeah. Like, it's the it's all the selection as well. So I was lucky in the sense I was able to to almost recognise what was happening to me. Um I, and before I got to the to the stage that or what happened to Callum and the Gold Coast, I'd I'd pulled myself out. I sat myself on the pavement before I got to that stage because of that I wasn't far away from from that losing my, my sense of thought, my chain of thought. Um, but I I knew that I, I was I was too far out to even try and coast into the finish. Um, it was a lap course, so then it was a five mile uh, loop on the Copacabana because there was no shower, there was no wind, there was no nothing. Um, just spectators and we ran past the grandstand every 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 lap. Um, so when you ran past the front of the grandstand, you went down like on a U bend at the bottom. So probably a mile after. Passing the grandstand, you'd pass the back of it. Mm -hmm. Susan used to see me pass the start finish line, go down the stairs, come out the back of the grandstand and see me there. I ran past her for the start of my third lap, um, and I didn't even didn't even recognise her. And I seen her at the same place every every time. Yeah, so just ran, just ran. Susan says that you, you had to start like a lost look in your eyes, and like three and a half mile later, that was when I dropped out. Um, I mean that's so. It just shows what 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 effect heat um can have on your body, but uh, uh, 
I won't be the first, and I, and I definitely won't be the last. It can happen to the best of them, and um, I don't. I wouldn't say if I was better prepared for the conditions, I would have finished the race. But I think I would have had a better understanding of how my body was going to react, and I would have, I would have altered my race plan. But like you said, it was the Paralympic Games, my first Paralympic experience. Um, was it the time to do something new? I don't know. I, I, if I could change it, I wouldn't. I wouldn't because it's made me a better and stronger person for that experience. Um, but yeah, it was. It was certainly a, a tough lesson to learn. Yeah, absolutely. And because I've been quite not annoyed, but the last few kind of you know big big marathons, you know, you know, seen Callum at Rio, and you know, he had you know, his amazing ninth place, and you know, and and that weather as well, and. And on to Doha, where he finished fourth. No, Vet still at that time of night, very, very hot. And then there was Tokyo. <laughs> still, I, I'm still waiting. Hopefully, in Paris next year, we get a marathon where it will still be warm, but they'll run it at, a, it won't be in a country where it's extreme heat, you mm-hmm. know. And you might, you, you might get, might see it. I mean, Kipchoge and Kipton, they're probably going to be the guys, they are going to be the guys up at the front, but for, you know, kind of the mere, you know, the mere mortal <laughs> Olympians. It'd be good to see a kind of one where they're not suffering from humidity and extreme heat, and the and you know, like the, the thirty odd degrees and stuff. That would be interesting to see. I think what played a big part in, in Paris as well is it's almost a home marathon because it's the closest one to home that's away. If mm-hmm. that makes sense. Yeah. It's literally just a I never flight it's across the water, so. Mm-hmm. I think that will hopefully play a big part as well as opposed to being on the other side of the world for the last two. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but but been... yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens. But yes, yeah, it's, it's certainly an exciting, an exciting time for the June running within Scotland. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's, I just think, just now, just especially like I think we're going to go a bit of a like a golden era. You know, we had that Neil Gurley on a few couple of months ago, and you know, we talked to him. You know, and you know, he's running 3.30 for 15 and mm. and that's that, and he's not winning a, a national no, he's not winning a, a world championship you know yeah. it's, it's, and we've got three you know three Scottish guys running those world class times and, and two of them have been world champions so it just yeah. it's incredible what's happening right now but oh, I mean you're saying no, no other side of the world and stuff but it's you know, getting selected for these championships, you're, you're getting to go to these countries and, and see them, etc. You know, I know that wasn't the result you wanted, but still a really good experience, you know, being there as part of the Olympic team and, you know, experiencing, you know, being on, you know, the, you know, the Paralympic start line as well. It must be a you know, great experience for you. Oh, um, something I'll never forget and an, an experience that money would never be able to buy. Um, to become a Paralympian is... is it doesn't happen to, to, to many people. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, so to be able to to be I don't call myself a Paralympian, but be able to to be named as a Paralympian was was just exceptional. Um and the whole experience, even even the race, Sean, um I was disappointed with the outcome, but like the whole experience I didn't I didn't um I left a bad t- a similar taste in my mouth. But the whole experience with the for flying out to I missed the, the holding camp, so I went straight to the Arctic Village. But yeah, it was just insane. It was just an, an amazing experience. Um, and like I said to you, the outcome wasn't great, but I wouldn't change it because how I propelled on from that and grew as a person and an athlete in terms of like resilience and stuff, then um, I wouldn't be who I am today. And like, like also say that about my accident. Um, I went through life changing apps and and it, and it no doubt changed my life. I wouldn't change it for the world because um, if I didn't have that, I wouldn't be doing this. Yeah, I mean, exactly. so the same thing what happened in Rio. Um, I think the the highs come from the lows, and in order to know where the highs, you want to know where the lows are. So um, I've came out the back of that. So I'm uh, I'm proud of that, and proud of the people that have supported me through that. Yeah, uh, absolutely. That's that's the path you that you're on now. And that's yeah, it's, what, it's, yeah. it's what's happening, you know, right now. It's and it's the, the results in your hard work. It's got to where you are right now. Yeah. And um, but no, I'm I'm saying that you know, but marathons been extreme heat. We had the London 2017. That was 
one of the ones <laughs> where it was not bad temperatures. But uh, falling on from Rio, like you obviously, there was the World Championships uh, for also the IPC, and you, 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 you got the gold. Yes, yeah, so that was two years post um, post Rio, so the twenty seventeen was always going to be a, a marathon where uh, you fall to pieces because that was my first one after Rio, or um, you prove to the the selectors or the powers that be at British Athletics that you've still got it. Mm-hmm. Um, twenty seventeen was the first year we going to Kenya as well, so because I was I was adamant that the experience of Rio was never going to happen again. What they kind of changed, not flip training on its head, but change of approach. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to try altitude, so I went to Kenya for the first time uh, for January. I think I flew out like the third to fourth of January, twenty seventeen, for four weeks. Nice. Um, and that that in itself was just a, an incredible, incredible experience. And it's and it's the friendships I made there with the locals and the other runners mm-hmm. are the friends for life. Um. 2017 was I prepared well for it. Uh, I, I knew I was in shape for it, but in the back of my head, I was thinking, is it going to go um, peak Tom again? And then luckily it didn't. So that, that year, um, I came away from London. Uh, I want to say a new PB of 2.37. Wow. Um, finished third in the IPC World Championship. So my first like world medal. Mm-hmm. Um but probably more importantly, it was, uh, uh, I wouldn't say I put Rio to bed because I, I, I spoke to Carl about this after the like the Gold Coast, um, that you don't get, that doesn't get put to bed until you're back from like the Commonwealth start line or for me, the, the Paralympic start line. So you can do 10 marathons a year or one marathon a year, um, but that wrong won't be put right until you can get back on that, like that, that playing field again. Um, but certainly, it was a it was a weight off my shoulders knowing that I was able to to still compete well and run well over the marathon distance, having had the setback in Rio. Um, and then I guess I just, I just again I was on like an uphill trajectory from there. Mm-hmm. I ran the London Marathon for Great Britain, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen. Um, I ran the IPC World Cup in twenty eighteen, and I finished first. Um, I think time was two thirty six, but the the weather that that year was horrendous. Like it was boiling, um, and then I ran it again in two thousand and nineteen, and the the World Para Athletics World Championships were in Doha that September, um, but the the marathon of the World Championships were in London end of April, um, and I finished second, so I I got. A, a, a proud achievement for me was to get Team GB on the medal table before the championships are actually started. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a lot of hope of Dave Weir securing gold or, or a medal, but Dave had to pull out through a puncture. Um, so I was only only I put Great Britain on the medal table that year, which was again an insane achievement and one I'm very very proud of. And then my PB. From that race is two twenty seven oh eight, and that stands in my marathon PB to this day. So, again, yeah, I now I run marathons like thirty six minutes quicker than I was when I was able bodied, albeit I train differently and prepare differently, and, and I've been full time a full time athlete since since November two thousand sixteen. So I came back from Rio, I worked a month, and my wife and I thought, nah, we've got one opportunity out of this, so let's let's just throw the kitchen sink at it. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. I've, I've lived a dream life for the last seven years now, and it's been it's been an absolute whirlwind. I've loved every minute of it. That's that's what I mean. That's like every athlete's dream, you know. Yeah, yeah. have been that full time, but that that's that's incredible. The that story, and able to go from you know fighting for your life to being a full time athlete and. Not being a full time athlete, but it's like you're not qualifying for teams. You've been a full time athlete, and you're up there. In, in your category and you're 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 challenging, you know, you're up there and you're you're pushing you know, pushing for the wins, you know, it's it must be a great feeling. Yeah. Again it keeps you motivated, but I think it also keeps you grounded. Um and I'm lucky I've got I've got like my wife especially, um 
as a first person to praise me and the first person to congratulate me, but it's also the first person is to to make sure that I'm remaining grounded and I, I always have done and I always will do. But yeah, the hard work has certainly paid off. Um and it makes it all kind of more worthwhile when you are getting those those selections and, and running well and just feeling well. Um you don't have to train hard in order but don't have to just, just get good performances to kind of to motivate you to train hard, it's, I think it's more just how you feel about yourself. You, you, you feel small differences in your body and your physique and, and whatever. Um, that in itself is a motivator just to, to get you to push on. And well, well, not everyone is going to listen to this. It's going to think, well, by training hard, I want to get to the next Paralympic Games or Olympic Games. We've all got our own achievements, and whether that be a part of PB or Yep. Or just to finish like a 10k, do you know what I mean? Um, everyone has their own individual achievements, but the beauty of running is we're all in it for the same game, we're all in it to do the same thing, and um, we're all starting the same start line, cross the same finish line. The effort it takes someone to run a four hour marathon or a five and a half hour marathon is the same effort it would have took Jogi to run a two hour marathon, same yep. for you, 244, same for me, for my PB. So it's all. It's all relative, but that's 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 the beauty of running. Yeah. Um, one one thing I I hate, and that's a strong word, is when people are speaking to me about performances and they'll say their marathon PB is three and a half hours, but that's nothing compared to yours. And I say, well, well it is, because your PB is is relative to you. My PB is relative to me, and yours is rel- Sean's relative to Sean. Um, compare that to that. Don't compare. Uh, I don't keep by myself to keep joking because we're worlds apart. <laughs> um, do you know what I mean? So it's, it's, it's people think that if they're not, they're not running as fast, they're not quite achieving as much, but, but they are. They yeah. are. And I can take my heart off the guys who are like a six hour marathon. That, that is more of a, in my opinion, more of an achievement than right. what, what you and I do. Um, so again, it's all relative. Yeah, absolutely. There's a woman in my work and she was saying, like she took up running, you no, know, uh, lose a bit of weight and stuff. And you know, I, I just recently joined the team about eight months ago, and, and she said, like, "Oh, what's your PB?" And I was like, uh, "For the half." She's like, "Yeah, I was like seventy six minutes." She's like, oh. "Like my PB is two hours 20. I was like, mm-hmm. well, "Well, well, yours is actually harder because you're in for an hour longer." You know what I mean, so you're actually spending more time out there than me. So it's actually, you no, know, you're working, you're working just as hard, but you're doing it for an hour longer. So put that in context and. Same when like, you go to you ask what your five k PB is and well oh, it's at sixteen ten and be like oh, I'm twenty eight minutes I was like I but it's still the same pain like mm-hmm. the pain I'm feeling at the end of a five k is the same pain that you're feeling that I, I don't find that it, it's it's all relative like you're saying it's it doesn't it's it doesn't get easier <laughs> it's still the exact same pain but you just run a wee bit quicker that's all I think as well for for like so you for yourself and. And others around that that time, like say sub three hours, um, you can prepare for a three hour marathon because you can run for three hours. You can't prepare for a, a five or six hour marathon because you're not going to go and run for that length of time. So you're always going into the unknown because you know that you've run for three hours and you felt all right. Mm-hmm. Um, the, probably the most these guys have run for again is two and a half to three hours, so they're they're looking to double that. Um, that's that's an unbelievable ask of the human body to do that without. Haven't had experienced that, so yeah, no, I, I take my heart off to these guys. I really do. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And it's the no, it's the nutritional demand as well for mm-hmm. another extra three hours. You know how many mm-hmm. gym you take, how much water do you take on? It's you know, it's it, it, it would be a lot harder because you know yeah. over you know a two or twenty seven marathon. I don't know about you. But for me, I'm probably going to be taking three or four gels at mm-hmm. Valencia. The time I'm going to probably run in, but for someone running six, seven hour marathons, they're going to have to take on a lot more than that. Yeah. Really. Not for the the effort of it, but just for the, the sheer duration that they're going to be out there for. Yeah. And it's, I take my hat off to that because I, if you asked me to get and run for seven hours, I'd be like, no, <laughs> I'll get and run three hours max. That'll be the way. Yeah. So we talked about that, but you've had your, your ankle surgery and that done. Um, what's that? Since May time, you're on your comeback now, getting your, your training back in again. 
So what's on the horizon for you? Any any targets in mind? We're looking at Paris or Paris is obviously in in our thoughts. Um I suppose just now given the, the extent of the surgery and the length of rehab um off the back of it, between now and the beginning of next year is just to get healthy. Um get fit. Once I'm healthy, get fit. And then see what we can achieve, see if we can make the, the standard for next year. And then, um, yeah, it just kind of takes as it comes, Sean. It's, it's, excuse me, it's all changed for me because the marathon has been taken out of the programme for Paris. So, um, I know that. I've dropped down. Pardon? I didn't know that. I'd been taking yeah, it. yeah. So, huh? I got a phone call about three months after Tokyo to say that there's going to be a press release in the next few days. Um, this is British Athletic, just to make you aware that the T46 marathon has been taken out of the programme for Paris. Um, but, this is but with our capital letters, there is a, a safety net for you. The T46 also compete in the 1500 metres. Oh. <laughs> so, to go from um, a marathon runner for 10 or 9, 10 years to a 1500 metre runner is, is a culture shock. Um, so I accepted that challenge. Uh, I've changed training groups and changed coach. So I'm now training with Steve Doig um, at Petrive. So a part of his group is Owen Miller, who won gold in Tokyo. Yes. On the T20, uh, T20 1500 metres. Um, mm. Ben Sanderlands, who won World Championships in the T20 1500 metres. Uh, a guy called Stephen Bryce, who's also T20. Yep. 1500 metres. So there's a, a tiny, tiny group there. Um, and there's mainstream athletes here as well. I think there's Alistair Gudgeon, who's a 357. Mm-hmm. Andrew Thompson, who's 350 low. A uh, young guy called Reese Marshall, who's, I think he's 351. Mm-hmm. Um, so a good, a really good group of runners. Uh, and nice, nice guys. So I've been with them for almost two years now. Well, a, a year that I, I, I missed due to uh, surgery and injuries. Uh-huh. So the, the target is for hopefully to, to, to get selected to compete for Great Britain in the T46 1500 metres next year in Paris. But if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, then I've had a good crack at it. Oh, it? What, what's the qualifying time for that? I don't know. Uh, I, I think to be in contention, I'd, I'd need to go under four minutes. Four minutes? Mm. Well, I'm going to be keeping a track of that. Yeah. <laughs> Please do, because I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. But no, you're in great company there. Um, yeah. Like where you've got, and people forget about that, you know, you've got world champions and Josh Kerr and Jake Whiting, but you've got para, Paralympic world champions and Owen Miller as well. And he from Scotland as well. And obviously, he won at races and he's very distinctive. You know, he's, he, when he's, you know, when he's racing, he's he's always pushing to go to the front. And yeah, very aggressive. He, because when I was at work, I was I set my phone. It was Channel Four that were doing the what's it called the the coverage for it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I was working in the branch at the time, and I made sure <laughs> that I didn't I didn't have anyone in my diary, and I uh, actually watched it, and he just like the the defending champion Owen just didn't give him a minute's peace like yeah. the whole race. Yeah. And he just kept pushing, and he you could tell the guys get fed up, and then when Owen kicked, the guy just. He had he'd had enough. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's just well, that's the way you see on that all these Scottish races. He's always yeah. just pushing, pushing. I know he definitely kicked, and he went into the race like in Steve. Steve Doig is coach or our coach. They're prepared for it really, really well, which is which is obviously the way we ran. Um, and having spoken to Owen and I travelled out to Tokyo together, um, or down to London together. And, we spoke a lot, obviously, in the village because both being from the same area um, helped when people couldn't, people are able to understand me because I was able to speak a bit slower and clearer about Owen, just speaks how Owen speaks, because um, that's a part of his, his, his disability, of, I suppose. Um, so we spoke a lot and I knew he was, he was confident, um, but I, I didn't think he would finish first. I remember this, so our tower block in Tokyo. And there was big screen TVs at the at the, at the basement level, and I sat watching his race with my S or the S and C coach for for British Athletics. Samurai sat and watched the race, 
and I went from being proper to broad faith um, in an instant when I was roaring at the TV, shouting on no one to, to win. And I just become, like, I didn't become Derek from Scotland. I became Delph of Fife. <laughs> and I was just <laughs> learning all these Fife lingo slang uh, that that was, uh, I just couldn't help myself. But yeah, that that's one part of, of the, the Tokyo experience that I won't forget is, is watching Tokyo uh, win, winning his race. And then I was walking, I was going to the food hall and I was walking to the elevators and no one I was on the same level. And he walked out the the elevator with his medal on his neck and he had a grin from wasn't from ear to ear, from eyebrow to eyebrow. It was honestly showing the biggest <laughs> smile you've ever seen anyone have on their face. And it was only and he was just oblivious to everything that was going on, which is probably a bit of a blessing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But it's it's incredible. I remember seeing Owen uh, you know, at like track leagues and stuff and he was standing there. He'd always I don't know why, he always singled me out and always spoke to me and yeah, he was always saying, and he showed me his tattoo with Olympic rings, and mm-hmm. I was like, "Oh, is that? But are you?" And I would ask him, he's like, "Oh, that's for the Special Olympics," and he's mm-hmm. like, "No." He said like, uh, "I want to go to Paralympics." And I was like, "I was like, you'll yeah. get there one day because I think it was like fifteen hundred meter, and he, he, I think he won it. Like he was just, but that was when he was like four ten shape or whatever. Yeah, like, fifteen. He was just rapid, just so so quick. And then after that, I was like, if he if he keeps going like at Paralympic level, he is going to." Yeah, in my mind, I was like, he'll, he'll qualify. And then when you see them, you know, winning, it, it was just incredible. Um, Don't get me wrong, him and Steve, Steve, our coach, they, they worked, they, they achieved a lot, they covered a lot of ground, but they, they worked exceptionally hard, obviously, to get to that level. Um, mm-hmm. Steve really brought out the best. You know, and, um, I think they were working together for a couple of years before he went to Tokyo. Two, uh-huh. three years anyway. So, But yeah, no, it was a, a good partnership and, and Steve's got a great group along there and he, and he, he brings out the best in everyone Aye, absolutely and that's what it's all about you get a good group there and I'll be interested 100%. to see interesting to see how you got on with the, with the 15 as well <laughs> we'll see what happens <laughs> be amazing so what we we'll like to do now is so end of every the interview we do I like to just ask a couple of fun questions for you know like from you know for any of our viewers and etc as well so if you're okay with that just yeah, mate, just be some on. generic questions. So, question number one. So, after you do like a big session or a big race, what's your kind of like go to meal afterwards? Um, straight after training. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I would. I love to come home to, um, chicken fetus. Oh, chicken fetus, nice. Yeah. Um, I love. A bowl of pasta before, or a, a good bowl of pasta before a session or, or, or a race. But um, yeah, after a session, especially like a, a Thursday night session in the summer, I love yep. coming home to a, a chicken feeders or a home or a barbecue. Aye, I see. Like, I'm, I'm quite partial to chicken for heat as well. I've just recently, I used to do them and, and you know, do the chicken in the pan and put your peppers and onions and all sorts. But now I found, well, I got an air fryer and. Yeah. You can just dice it all up, put it in the air fryer, put your seasoning in, and then 80 minutes later, it's there. Okay. <laughs> it's incredible. We've got air fryer, but I've never, exper- I never experimented with the, with the fears in a bit. Um, never say never. Oh, there's there's tons on Instagram. Tons mm. air frying. I did well, I did one last night, but not a fajita, just two chicken breasts with piri piri yeah. and shoved it in 20 minutes later, done. I was like, this is incredible. This has changed my life. So... The question number two. So I don't know if you drink that at all, or if you get a a, oh, a fizzy juice that you go to. But when you have maybe ran, you know, if it's a national cross country, etc., or if it is after a big marathon or stuff, like what's kind of like like a wee drink you go to? If it's alcohol, or if it is just like no, I right, I right, good glass of brew. And my go to is a, a cold kind of diet coke. So I've not um, touched alcohol in like, eleven years. Oh, okay. Yeah. Nice. Just the just the choice. Um, I would rather get up on a Sunday morning and go for a run and have a hangover all day, and I like my food too much to be off my food. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm using a designated driver when when if and when we go out. But you might go to I I love a, a kind of diet cold kind of diet coke. You cannot beat it. A nice one. Yeah. I think for me, I think it'll be like I love a an ice cold coke or a, a iron brew, but. 
I'm going with my, my last two marathons. I, I love uh, an ice cold pint of Guinness after. <laughs> they, they get in far too easy after a marathon. Uh, far too easy. Um, but the question three, so spoke about a lot about running, but what is your, obviously you would watch the athletics on TV, but what's, what is your other favourite sport out with running? Football. Football. Nice one. Yeah. You got a football team? I'm my new man. Man, you are you and Craig Ruddy were best friends then. <laughs> my grandma's from Salford in Manchester, so I was kind of brought up around following um Man U. Nice one. Um, so yeah, it's, I've always been a Man U fan, but it's, it's tough times for the club at the minute, unfortunately. Yeah, like uh, Craig Ruddy on a WhatsApp group, he's just like, what's going on here? Like, <laughs> I think the Copenhagen game was the kind of, you know, like yes. that was the one where, where Craig finally cracked. Like, what the hell was going on? But for me, like uh, I'm a Celtic fan, I'm just like, Craig, welcome to my world. We always get destroyed in, in yeah. Europe anyway. So yeah. <laughs> no, a club of that size and that stature should be you'd expect them doing better. But they've lost their, their CEO's just he's resigned but he's leaving at the end of the year. I think yeah. Ten Hart on a on a, a loose nail. So but um yeah, football in my news is my go to. Nice one. Nice one. And uh, next question. So what is what would be your favourite film? Um, Good Will Hunting. Oh, good choice. Good choice. Mm, I'd never it. seen. I'd never seen that, and I met, I met my girlfriend. I was telling all the films I hadn't seen. She's just like, ah, "You've yeah. not seen Top Gun. You've not seen Sean Shank. You've yeah. not seen Good." I'm like, ah, "I'm sorry, look." But I watched it, and I was like, "Why haven't I watched this?" It's and I, then I realised where that scene comes from. Like, do you like apples? That's finally yeah. realised. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, I've I've watched it oh, 50 times. <laughs> that, that and then um, the first Breaking 2, the original Breaking 2 from going around Monza. I used yeah. to watch them two films uh, the night before a big marathon. I don't know why. Yeah. I, I really, I've seen the, the one where he did break two, but I really, I really preferred the way National Geographic did the first one. Yeah, that's one, just, yeah, around Monza in Italy. Yeah. yeah. I just really like how they went round, like you know, Ethiopia for Decisa, the uh, for yeah. Tedesi, and then for uh, Bekele as well. And I think that that just going back to the marathon stuff, I think that's just Tedesi. Uh, I just find it incredible how his whole running career, you no know, world, he was world record holder at half marathon, but when he did marathons, he didn't take on a single gel and yeah, didn't yeah. take on any water, and he ran like two eleven. And people were just like, "How? Why? Why don't you?" And he was just like, mm, "Well." And I think with that, I think after that, he started. I think he went on to did a marathon, and I think he, he ran like two o five. He took six minutes off his PB because he took on water and gels. It's it's insane. Uh, I liked it when they followed them in the lab, and you see like the other side of of the prep and the the, the studies for it. So that was interesting. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, absolutely. I've I seen that guy Andrew Jones. He's on he's on a he's on a page on Facebook. Well, it's, right. it's a group called Sub Three Marathon. And I've seen him there and he's posted a couple of things on I was like, maybe try and get him on a podcast. Uh, if he doesn't if he doesn't mind a weirdo mission, like, how you doing? Um <laughs> I've seen your name, like do you fancy coming on? <laughs> I think he'd be quite a good guest just to get a good insight of the, the sub two uh, stuff. So next question, who's your favourite male athlete? Um, I say it's, it's split. So my time and you know, like and with the Paralympic guys, I've got no rest of my head really, really well. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd say it's torn between him and Carlton. Um, for another guy, see, I've shot a company. Carmen did it work. Um and the guys at Tam really um yeah, Cool. So you're breaking up there, but I could I could see it was a uh, Callum Hawkins or Richard Whitehead. Yeah. Yeah, I think sorry. Callum I think Callum is I think is a probably for a lot of people he's you know that him and Derek just kinda they kinda put Scottish marathon running on the map, the times they've run yeah. and so I think they've really, really they've raised the standard. So they did. And then um, Carmen and I 
we'll call him Derek and I went to Flagstaff in 2019 for four weeks. Yeah. Uh, and I, I, I realised then, like, geez, these boys, I knew they worked hard, but their work ethic and their, their humble and, yeah, no, they're just, just, and the dad, Robert, was with us as well, so yeah, it was a, a nice, nice family. Yeah. Um, hard, hard workers. Oh, definitely. Like Derek, I'm good pals with Derek. He, he trained with us down in Greenock for yeah. like a long time and just his, you know, his work ethic and everything else and doing sessions, it's, mm. you know, he just had the attitude, like, it's got to be done. Like, yeah, that's the forever. session. That's yeah. that's just the session. It's got to be done. And uh, it was just, he really opened up my eyes on how mm. hard you really do need yeah. to work. Callum joined us as well for a good few sessions and that's, you've seen the talent in Callum. He was just, like, it, was like, it was like we were you know, 18, 19 at the time. Callum was like 14, 15, and he was like, you know, he was putting Craig and Derek to the sword. And at that point, you no, know, Craig and Derek, mm-hmm. you know, brilliant, brilliant runners. And Callum was making, was, you know, in sessions, really making them work hard. And I was mm-hmm. like, he's, he's going places. Uh, but though, for the, for the final question, um, what would, what's been like, doesn't need to be your own, but it can be what's been a sporting moment uh, that's been like for like your favourite. It's been a, a it can be in any sport. It can be Man United when the Champions League or whatever. But what's been your your favourite sporting moment that you've experienced or watched? I think when it when it stands out, um, quite a strange one actually. So when we went to Rio, uh, off the back of Rio. The Scots that were on uh, Para GB or Team GB, Olympic and Paralympic, were invited to a series of Scotland rugby matches. Um, the ones that we got invited to was in Scotland v Australia. I think Australia picked us by one point, but for that day we got VIP. Uh, so we got like hospitality seats. We got a pitch play at half time and a meal afterwards. The whole experience, Sean, was incredible, but the pitch play at half time was. It's, it's something I'll never ever forget to walk around Burryfield. It was completely packed. Um, the hairs on the back of my neck were standing for the whole lap because I, I did feel like an absolute superstar. Um, just, just what, 30,000, 40,000 people just giving you a standing ovation. Um, it was just, and by luck, my uncle was in the, in the in attendance that day and he was able, he was in the stands. When his nephew was doing a pitch parade of Murrayfield, it must have been he said a special thing for him. But for myself, um, that's probably one. Of, that's a standout memory for me. Was that was doing a pitch parade at Murrayfield, um, after Rio. Yeah. Right. That's, yeah. a, that's, that's something else. I, I I didn't know. I didn't know you had that experience as well. That's amazing. Yeah. Excellent. But, um, but just one one last thing. So before we finish up, so you. We spoke about your your whole you know life and your running career, but if anyone's watching this who maybe need a bit of motivation or people who just need to be better, you know, extra help with their running, etc., or just need to be better confidence, what kind of message uh, would you would you uh, or advice would you give out to anyone? Uh, doesn't matter what level. Like what kind yeah. of advice would you give out to the runners? Um, never give up hope. Um, always believe in yourself. If you want others to believe in you, you that won't happen unless you believe in yourself. Um, and never forget why you're doing it. Um, it's too easy to get caught up in times and targets and achievements and um, what got you into running and why do you still do it? And that's what keeps you keeps you motivated and keeps you almost keeps you grounded and humble. Um, and realize that Rome is never built in a day. Everyone, whether it be Kipchoge, you, me, or the, the man next door, everyone has to start somewhere. Um, and you and everyone's start time, start position is again relevant to them. Mm-hmm. Um, compare apples to apples and pairs to pairs. Um, don't get caught up. On, I've got loads of sorry, I'm grabbing on here. No, not at all. Don't, don't get caught up what other people are doing, just focus on what you're doing. Um, and like I said, the results and performances and training and preparation all take care of itself. Yeah, exactly. Just control it, but, but you can control yourself. Yeah. yeah. Right. Well, Derek, thank you very, very much. I've 
thoroughly enjoyed. I've been wanting to get you on the podcast for a while. I'm just really happy we could make it happen. And it's you've got an, an incredible story. And I really, really, I really, really do think that you should be contacting someone to say, look, I've I've got this story. Can you write a book? Because I think that book would, I think a lot of people would be really interested to read, read your story. Well, thanks, man. Again, thanks for having me. Thanks for me allowing me to, to spread the the positive message and, and almost raise the profile of para sports. Mm -hmm. Apologies, I've taken so much uh, so much of your time. Has that been a couple of hours we've been chatting? No, 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 not at all. It's it's uh, this is this is why I do it. It's you yeah. know, you're talking to the people about running and and then I think it's just really, really important to you know highlight, you know, the Scottish running scene and highlight people like yourself who who have had the journey you've had in a in Scottish running and, and celebrating yeah. the fact that, that the, where you are now and just to highlight all you guys and how good and what benefits running can bring to people's life. You know, if it like you say it starts off, you know, a park run if you run five K and you know, an hour that's that's fine if it gets you out the door and gets you fitter and gets you healthy and yeah. gets you making new relationships etc then mm. that's that's even that's even better reason for yeah. getting into it rather than getting into training for the Olympics you know <laughs> <laughs> but thank you very much <laughs>